German scholar Heinrich Barth is thought to be one of the greatest European explorers of Africa. His scholarly preparation, ability to speak and write Arabic as well as learn African languages meant that he carefully documented the details of the cultures he visited. At the time, Europe knew very little of Africa. Thus, in 1850, Britain sponsored him to explore the entire continent. Bath established friendships with African rulers during his five years of travel and was welcomed in some societies as the first European to visit. At the beginning of his journey from Tripoli in modern-day Libya, then down to the largest hot desert in the world, the Sahara Desert, he discovered something that did not make sense to him. On the walls and caves and rocks in the desolate land, he saw prehistoric paintings and engravings of hippos, elephants, antelopes, giraffes, and other savanna species that cannot survive in the sweltering heat of the Sahara. He also saw depictions of livestock and grazing animals like cattle and sheep. While you might see these animals in Eastern and Central Africa today, they cannot survive in the modern-day Sahara. Even more confusing, the rock art was incredibly accurate, which meant that the artists who drew them were really familiar with the animals they were depicting, which also meant that for the artists to be knowledgeable about hippos and giraffes, those animals had to have lived there. Basically, the art was an obvious mismatch to the inhospitable wilderness Heinrich was exploring. Like many artists today, the ancient artists of North Africa painted what they saw in their surroundings. Despite widely accepted general beliefs that the Sahara has always been a desert, Heinrich had discovered contradicting evidence that pointed to a completely different environment thousands of years ago. Apparently, the Sahara has not always been a searing wilderness with little to no rainfall, but was once a vast savanna, reminiscent of grasslands of the Serengeti. And I don't mean just a few years of extra showers of rain. I mean a climate that was so wet for so long that humans and animals made themselves at home in the Sahara. The mystery, therefore, is how and when this lush grassland turned into the barren wasteland we see today. The Sahara is the largest source of dust on the planet. Winds known as Northeasterly Hamatan picks up millions of tons of dust each year and carries it past the western edge of the Sahara, traveling 10,000 kilometers across the Atlantic Ocean to the Americas. Much of this dust settles on the ocean floor off the coast of Mauritania. Therein lies the first evidence of a wet Sahara. The amount of sediment that built up over hundreds of thousands of years serves as a geological chronicle of North Africa's climate history. Layers thick with dust indicate that the Sahara was drier and very little or no vegetation was present like it is today. With less dust, the conclusion was that the Sahara was covered with plenty of vegetation and was much wetter, a period known as the African Humid Period. These sediments contain layers of ancient sediment deposited over millions of years. Each layer contains traces of Saharan dust as well as the remains of life forms such as tiny shells of plankton as well as pollen grains. Past analysis of these sediments have unearthed a puzzling pattern. It would appear that the Sahara shifts between wet and dry periods every 100,000 years, a geological cycle that scientists have linked to the Earth's Ice Age cycles, which seem to also come and go every 100,000 years. Pieces of the puzzle are coming together to reveal the Sahara's watery past. However, geology alone cannot explain why the Sahara was green. Milankovitch cycles can help us better understand why the Sahara's climate swings like a pendulum between desert and grassland. Eccentricity, obliquity, and precession 
all which impact the African climate on long geologic timescales, leading to larger changes in our climate over tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. Eccentricity is a measure of the deviation of the Earth's orbit from a perfect circle. Over time, the pull of gravity from our solar system's two largest giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, causes the shape of the Earth's orbit to vary from nearly circular to slightly elliptical. These variations are in cycles of 100,000 years and affect the distance between the Earth and the Sun and in turn affects the length of summers and winters. Obliquity, on the other hand, refers to the angle of Earth axis of rotation. It is tilted as it travels around the Sun. Obliquity is why Earth has seasons. Over the last million years, it has varied between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees perpendicular to Earth's orbital plane. Finally, the cycle with the most influence on the rains in Africa is precession. As planet Earth rotates, it wobbles slightly upon its axis, much like a wobble toy does. This wobble is due to tidal forces caused by the gravitational influences of the Sun and the Moon that cause the Earth to bulge at the equator, affecting its rotation. The main climatic effect of precision is to shift the season when the Earth has its closest pass to the Sun, which is known as perihelion. Today, perihelion occurs in the Northern Hemisphere winter, but at 20,000 years ago, it occurred in the Northern Hemisphere summer, and summer radiation over North Africa was about 7% higher than it is today. Precision greatly influences North Africa's climate because it controls the strength and amount of the monsoon rains. Increasing summer season solar radiation causes the North African landmass to heat up relative to the adjacent Atlantic Ocean due to the lower thermal inertia of the land surface compared to the ocean. The increased heat over the Sahara created a low pressure system that ushered moisture from the Atlantic Ocean into the barren desert. Usually, wind blows from dry land towards the Atlantic, spreading dust that builds beaches in the Caribbean as well as fertilizes the Amazon. Anyway, the resulting summer rains nourish the landscape, resulting in a green Sahara and the African humid period. On the other hand, during winter, the land cools relative to the ocean and the winds reverse and blow from land toward the Atlantic, resulting in dry conditions across the Sahara, similar to what we see today. More undisputed evidence to a green Sahara point to past lake basins, commonly found between dune depressions and other low-lying regions where ancient lake bed sediment and shoreline deposits are exposed. Most of the early Holocene Paleo lakes were small, but numerous and widespread. Some lake basins in North Africa were exceptionally large, as large as the Caspian Sea today. These so-called mega lakes occurred in different areas. In the north was Mega Lake Fezan in modern-day Libya. In the south was Mega Lake Chad, shared between modern-day Chad, Niger, Nigeria, and Cameroon. In the west was Shorts Mega Lake in modern-day Algeria, and in the east was Mega Lake Trukana in Kenya. Based on geological records, these must have been permanent open basin lakes, indicating that annual moisture supply exceeded evaporation for many millennia during the African humid period, even in the driest regions of the modern-day Sahara. At their maximum size, they would have covered about 10% of the Sahara, making them three times larger than the Great Lakes. At its peak, around 8,000 years ago, Paleo Lake Mega Chad was the largest freshwater lake on Earth, sprawling 400,000 square kilometers or 150,000 square miles, and would still have been the largest lake on Earth today. NASA recently shared a spectacular image of what was once 
the lake larger than the massive Caspian Sea. Today, remnants of this once massive lake is known as Lake Chad and is just a fraction of its former size and sits inside the ancient body of water's shoreline that is still etched into the desert landscape. The drying of Lake Mega Chad reveals a story of dramatic climate change in the Sahara, from a giant lake to sand dunes and dust due to changes in rainfall from the West African monsoon. I don't know about you, but I find it very interesting how small fluctuations in something as simple as a wobble can lead to dramatic changes in the climate of a region that made it swing like a pendulum between desert and grassland. The next wobble in the axis is set for 15,000 years from now. Only then will the Sahara turn lush green again. Meanwhile, scientists have been brainstorming on another way to turn parts of the Sahara into a green landscape drenched with rain. According to their hypothesis, if massive solar and wind farms were installed, they could increase heat and humidity in the areas around them. An increase in precipitation, in turn, could lead to vegetation growth. However, this huge undertaking has yet to be tested in the Sahara. So until such a project gets funding, humans may have to wait until 15,000 years are over to see whether the Sahara will turn green again. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. If so, why not hit the like button and consider subscribing. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.